Well, we've heard from Robert, Robin about the remarkable St. Philip salt pan complex, a wonderful archaeological survival of an almost intact 18th century industrial pr process with the foundations of nine pan houses, a still standing wind engine, and the channels, settling tank, and wooden pipework that brought brine to the pans. But what of the wider landscape of which it was a part? Where did the coal that fired the pans come from? How was it brought to St. Philip's? And how did the salt reach its markets? In the 18th century, transport by land was extremely expensive, but by sea, it was vastly cheaper. A salt works had to have close access not only to clean seawater, but also to coal and a good harbour with a level down or downhill access. These had to be interdependent or costs quickly outweighed profits. There's no coal mine in the area today, and while nearby St. Monant's is a fishing harbour, it wasn't suited to commercial operation. But Pitt and Weem, a mile along the coast, was already a thriving port, enjoying trading links with London and the continent. The main export was coal from a nearby mine, of a quality highly regarded around the North Sea. Pitt and Weem's best coal warmed the houses of London and Hamburg, its name an assurance of quality. But the small coal was unmarketable as domestic coal. However, it was okay for making salt. So if a coal mining enterprise was adjacent to the sea, its unsaleable coal, its pan coal, could be used to make salt. So salt production at St. Philip's was not a standalone enterprise, but a value addition to a much bigger coal industry. There's no visible coal mine in the vicinity today, and there hasn't been for nearly 200 years. So where was this vanished industrial uh, landscape, and do traces of it ex uh, remain? First, there are documentary sources, which Paula will discuss in a moment. But next are the maps. The first edition of the Ordnance Survey 6-inch map was published in 1855, before the Leven and East Fife Railway was built. It includes residual elements of the landscape it overlies. It shows, for example, the nine pan buildings of 1772-3, located and preserved by Robin and his colleagues. Note the wind engine and the track leading to, towards the pans from the escarpment. The mineral well is another feature associated with mining. It was the adit which drained the mine complex, still revealed by its mineral-strained mineral uh, uh, um, discharge. Then there's a manuscript map of 1785. Until recently, it's only been known as a faded photocopy in the National Archives, believed to be the only surviving version. But Paula has discovered the original among the Balkaski papers in St. Andrew's University Library, and I'm much indebted to her for its use. The map owes its existence to litigation between Sir John Anstruther and his cousin Sir Robert, Sir John owned much of the land and all the mining rights below ground, but Sir Robert had inherited some strips of the original run-rig cultivation crisscrossing the area. But there was plenty of room for Sir John to sink pits in his, on his own ground, and he was able to skirt a horse-drawn wagonway around the top end. However, a dispute arose that brought the lawyers in. Sir John wanted to run a drain from the main coal workings some 800 metres to the sea via the adit away down here. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this involved laying a pipe under one of Sir Robert's rigs, and its fall required it to run close to ground level. Though below plough depth, Sir Robert claimed that it interfered, uh, it infringed his cultivation rights and called in the lawyers. To contest the claim, Sir John's factor, Gavin Hogg, made a detailed survey not only of the surface, but the underground features of the contemporary coal field, recording earlier workings, for example, a coal pit said to be a horse gin in Cromwell's time. 
the pans aren't included on the map, they go off it just down, down here. Uh, but a branch of the wagonway is labelled wagonway to pans, that's it down there. So the wagonway served not only the pans, but also transported coal and salt to Pitt and Weem. Another source is aerial photography. Uh, <coughs> In 1984, I began a pro program of, in collaboration with our former Royal Commission. That summer was one of prolonged drought, and grain crops between Pitt and Weem and St. Monance revealed a plethora of marks in the ripening fields. Buried ditches retained moisture and remained green for longer, while foundations or other impermeable features showed as lighter uh, signatures. This detail is a palimpsest of history. These fugitive traces up here um, are probably prehistoric hut circles. Running across the frame is a broad ditch, this one here, um, uh, associated with rig and furrow cultivation. The curved parallel, li parallel lines here um, are, are ditches of the horse-drawn wagonway, identifiable on Gavin Hogg's map. The final feature is this now demolished railway running and actually joining in with the wagonway line uh, shortly. The bridge over the former railway, which you see at the top there, um, is still called Waterless Bridge for reasons I'll explain later. Another crop mark shows the square entrance to a coal shaft with the framework of a, ho a horse winding engine beside it. Together, these sources help to reveal the 18th century landscape. Let's start with this feature, uh, a circular um, uh, parch mark within a, a, a surround. It's identifiable as what Hogg calls the seat of the first windmill, which was used to pump water from an adjacent coal shaft labelled First Deep at the western edge of the underground workings, 228 feet down. This was replaced in the 1770s by a steam engine west of Coal Farm. No trace of the main wagonway's terminus is evident, but Hogg places it a, sh a short distance southwest of the wind engine, uh, somewhere down here, uh, which gives us a reasonably accurate uh, placement for the start of the wagonway. And numer numerous earlier pits are shown in the crop. The wagonway heads towards Collinsborough Road, which it crosses in the vicinity of the later Waterless Bridge. It continues for 60 metres in a straight line before curving to skirt the disobliging Sir Robert's rigs. So, I can hardly see it from here, but uh, the wagonway is coming in here and then curving round uh, and lining up along like that, as it's shown on the map. The conjunction is no coincidence. The line of the 18th century wagonway is clear on the 1855 map. Uh, first as a field boundary and uh, so followed by a, a, a trackway, uh, which is, as I say, d undoubtedly uh, the track of the original wagonway. Um, uh, this redundant route would be a natural one for the railway company to follow in 1865 and the railway's crop bark signature, as we see in earlier photographs, merges with the line of the abandoned wagonway track. So here we leave Hogg's map. Um, we go off the edge, um, uh, but we, the, the wagonway, wagonway diverges at Pittenweem Station. It comes to there on the rail line of the later railway, and then it's got to come down here uh, towards Pittenweem Harbour. Um, and uh, this detail from the 1855 map shows the uh, part of the wagonway appearing uh, 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 under the guise of a, a trackway labelled rope walk. It's a reused segment of the wagonway exploited by the town's burgeoning fishing industry. 
The rope work is lo walk is, is long gone, but the line is picked up at this house on the Mary Gate, where place name evidence kicks in, bringing us back to the maps. Beyond the Priory is a rectangular, or was a rectangular field, now built over, called Abbey Park, and through, through it a curved line descends the hill above the harbour to emerge on the shore through a gap in the houses here. So it comes down. There, there's, there's the house with the, 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 the wagonway name. There is the cutting of the wagonway, descending the hill, coming through a gap in the houses and lining up with the central pier of Pittenweem Harbour. And the pier, uh, which we see in this photograph, the pier was demolished. It's not the pier that's there now. It's demolished 100 or so years ago. Uh, that photograph shows it before it was demolished, uh, now replaced by a, a central pier a bit further over. It remains to trace the branch line that linked the coal field to the pans and took salt to the harbour. We, we see that just beyond the, 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 the salt pans, the ramp going up the escarpment there, which joins onto the edge of Hogg's map. Off it goes up here, all the way across there, uh, and then eventually uh, lining up or joining with the main circular route to Pitt and Weem. And as we cross the Collinsborough Row, or well, well you just we're, we're in here now, this sector, we pick it up as a very clear crop mark. And when it crosses the road, we pick it up yet again here. This is the square mark of what we can identify as deep pit here. And beside it, you can see a square or rectangular parch mark, which I'm sure is associated with the pit as, as the area from which the sort of machinery and so forth operated. But this was later uh, replaced by Waterless Farm, and you can see the square crop mark uh, in the farmyard of Waterless Farm. And so, uh, in the, uh, this 18th century um, industrial landscape survives in the rural, or I should, should say, note, that the reason that the farm was called Waterless Farm is not because it doesn't cross over water, it reflects the farm's inability to hold moisture in the soil because it percolated into the abandoned um, uh, workings far below. And so this 18th century industrial landscape survives in the rural one of today. On the left is the hog map redrawn for clarity. On the right is the modern landscape um, uh, showing in red its 18th century industrial predecessor revealed by documents, maps and archaeology. Thank you.